Good morning, everyone. And welcome. It is so good to look out over this sanctuary and see you all. It's just a joy. I'm Leslie Gibbons, and I'm your Sunday associate this morning. And uh, for anyone visiting us for the first time, and I don't know if I see any faces. <laughs> oh, good. Hello. <laughs> um, and we're a lay-led uh, community, and we don't have a minister. So every service here is different, There's a different person up here. Uh, we always offer something new, something challenging, something worth uh, debating, talking about. Um, we hope you find us a spiritual home with a difference. Uh, there is no dogma here. We love ideas, we love discussion, and we look at life, and we look at all of life's dimensions, reflections, and challenges through the lens of our eight principles and our many sources. And all these frame our spiritual life. So please join us for soup afterwards, downstairs, sandwiches. sandwiches. We've got sandwiches. Oh, even better. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Diane. And um, yeah, come and, and meet us and talk to us. We're all friendly. We'd love to say hello. And I'm not going to be alone up here this morning. I'm pleased to say we're lucky to have our own Paul Sangaila here. And he's going to help me out. He's going to be our guest speaker. And I'll introduce him more fully in a few minutes. But first, let's light our chalice. So please join me as Paul lights our chalice, and you're going to have to start from scratch, Paul. We had uh, a small uh, technical difficulties this morning, <laughs> and uh, therefore things have not been lit. So forgive me, I got lit, but the candles did not. Ah, thank you, Paul. Yeah, just light the top one. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, and join me for our words up on the screen. We kindle this flame as a symbol of our gathering. Lovely. We're also going to light two more candles this morning. And the first is the candle of joys and concerns because every Sunday when we walk through those doors, we bring with us our own worries, our own challenges, our own celebrations, our worries, our fears, and, uh, and our laughter as well. Sometimes we share these with the congregation, but sometimes we keep them silent and close to our hearts. So we're going to light a candle this morning for all those worries and all those cares that you may be, that you may be carrying this morning and those joys as well. And thank you, Paul. And I want to remind you that if you or anybody you know needs some help, some care in any way, please just let anyone on the board know. Let Shirley MacDonald know. She's right here. She's the chair of our cares, <laughs> our cares and concerns committee. And I can assure you confidential, confidentiality is prime here. Um, it goes no farther than us, but perhaps we can help you. So please let us know. Now, my thoughts and my Unitarian prayers this morning also go to those outside our community who are facing hardship or pain or war or hunger. There are places out there where humanity seems to have disappeared completely. So I would like to light a candle of concern and have a moment of silence as we send our thoughts out to those people who are in need and who are in trouble. Pray in whatever form it takes for you for peace and compassion and even love. We wish that to settle on our troubled world. So Paul, have we, got a, we have. Yeah. Our candles are lit, wonderful. 
So please stand if you are willing and able for our first song, Turn the World Around, which is what I just hoped we would do. Shore Unitarian Community, where our mission is to live with depth, meaning, and purpose. And we aspire to live that mission with joy and hope and love, both here in church and out in our larger communities. And we meet on the shared and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people and hold a reverence and a respect for this land and for all those who hold it dear. We are aware of and hold respect for the past, and we move forward with truth and a wish for reconciliation in both our worlds, in this diverse and complex world. Now, we all come from different places, different walks of life, different religions, different beliefs, but no matter how you experience the sacred, we hope and we want you to feel welcome here, because here, together, we find love and comfort and connection, and sometimes, may I say, often challenge, and we're walking on our life's journey together. And we're going to delve into the realm of the mind's eye this morning with Paul. We're gonna talk about who we are and how we come to be us, how we're shaped and molded into the people we think we are. And does this happen because are we the people we think we are? I mean, really, who are you, really? And I mean, who am I, really? Know thyself and to thy own self be true. That's more easily said than done, especially if you have led or you lead a complicated life. Sometimes I think we present ourselves as different people under different circumstances. Or is this just, is this thought just a reflection of my own confusion as a child 
who was repeatedly moved from one culture to another, one environment to another, and back again multiple times. When I finally landed in Vancouver and stayed here, I was still wearing my school uniform, plus a tie, plus a Panama hat, and plus bright blue bloomers under my tunic. Oh dear. Yeah, it, and, and that is exactly the response I got, by the way. I mean, eventually, I had two different types of handwriting, two different ways of speaking. I can be awfully nice if you wish me to, because I took elocution lessons, and two different ways of dressing was depending if I was home or with my family. I didn't invite friends home. My God, my, I would be exposed. Know myself? You've got to be kidding. I had no idea who I was. But seriously, was I a construct of my parents' dreams and needs, or a construct of my own needs to be like my friends? My genes, the stimulus of my environment, all this made up me. But I always had my quirky brain. Or was I, was I just an actor with, with a bad script? I don't know. But to think on that, let's bring our choir up to sing, We're Free to Decide. Thank you, Alison. Now let me introduce Paul Sangaila to you. He's our, day's, our today's speaker. He's a member of our congregation. I'm sure you all know him, but here are some fun facts. He's been a member of our congregation for some years. He's a clinical psychologist with a PhD from Simon Fraser. He's worked in a geriatric psychology department psychiatry department, in outpatient clinics in mental health in West Vancouver and in northern BC. And although he is retired now, he's now counseling in addiction and recovery. So I give the floor now to Paul, and he is going to lead us through the mind's eye. Perhaps I'll figure out who I am by the end of this. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Leslie. And in this era of DIY services, um, these uh, services come out of all kinds of conversations. This came out of a conversation over lunch with Leslie um, and reminded me of all kinds of interesting facts and ideas that have been rattling around inside my head for many years throughout my career as a psychologist. Uh, and also in counseling now, um, 
I've worked as a psychologist mostly assessing people with brain injuries of various kinds. Uh, many assessments in older patients that have dementias, uh, declining physical and mental abilities, but also younger adults with traumatic brain injuries, tumors, strokes, and all the neurodiverse conditions that we recognize now, like learning disabilities, attention deficit disabilities, autism, uh, mental retardation. I've assessed people uh, for mental competency, for legal affairs, and also personal affairs. And currently, in doing counseling with people in recovery, uh, in addictions, people are experiencing homelessness, poverty, broken lives due to abuse and neglect in childhood, as well as brain disorders due to uh, depression, impulse control, and use of substances. In university, you learn a theory. You learn about how memory and language change in dementias, how psychosis affects language and attention, long-term effects of substances like alcohol. But once in the real world, you're dealing with people with real life issues. Uh, maybe we can have the next slide. And this is one of the um, normal issues in, uh, in technology. We can't get the clicker to communicate with the, with the um, uh, projectors, so I'm gonna communicate with uh, Annabelle using hand signals. Okay, let's take for example, um, a real life person in distress. Take for example a Mrs. Maxwell. They, this is fictitious, but it's a, a, a common case. Say an 80 year old lady living alone in her condo. She's referred to the geriatric service for assessment. She's been yelling at neighbors, accusing her neighbors of plotting to kill her, reporting to her doctor that her family's been trying to steal her things, and saying that COVID viruses are being sprayed out of her light sockets. So these kinds of delusions and strange changes in behavior are, are common in many neurological conditions. There's the, those are the objective signs. She's lost 30 pounds um, and uh, uh, she has difficulties with living. Then there's the subjective side. Mrs. Maxwell is suspicious of me. She doesn't like doctors in general. She's scared. What can I assess reliably? These are her symptoms. Symptoms are subjective. Signs are objective. Um, it's this relationship between objective and subjective that I'd like to address, which is really the mind-old body-mind problem, the ages-old mind-body problem. And um, it's a uh, long-time philosophical issue. But modern science, computing, Experimental psychology, neuroimaging in particular, have advanced dramatically. So in the next 20 minutes, I'll talk about some general ideas relating to awareness, how it might relate to thoughts, beliefs, and social behavior, and a sense of self. I'll focus on a particular theory a contemporary neuroscientist at Princeton, Michael Graziano, has come up with this theory, which I will elaborate in a little bit more detail. We won't come up with any definitive answers, but I hope it'll raise some questions about the, your sense of self and your behavior. So buckle your seatbelts. We'll take a ride through some new ideas in psychology. Go ahead, Annabelle. There we go. Awareness and consciousness. I'm going to argue that subjective uh, awareness, your subjective experience, is actually a high level of mental processing in your brain, mostly in your brain, but including your gut and many, many parts of your body, in which the mind or the brain is organizing or modeling its own lower down processes of attention and forming schemas, forming ideas about things. This creates a feeling of awareness. When that's combined with other ideas that you have about memories from your own life, your beliefs, feelings, and goals, it creates an umbrella idea of a sense of self. So there's this long-standing issue about are the mind and the body separate? Um, the uh, current thinking is that they are closely interrelated, and where is the actual, where is the rubber that meets the road between mind and body? So let's just take an experiential point of view uh, to start with the conscious and the unconscious. Let's say I'm standing here in the sanctuary looking at a painting. Okay, there's a number of paintings on the wall. I noticed that, um, uh, so from the external world, I'm looking at a painting. And I'll just focus on one in the back corner there. I think it was called Earth and Fire. It's an acrylic, 
And it's, um, I'm looking at the content, the, the, uh, uh, um, the brush strokes, the composition, and then I'm th those are the external things, then the internal experience is that of color, and also uh, composition. What does that composition evoke in me? Uh, it evokes thoughts and feelings, thoughts about the content, maybe about the artist. And then I look at the, the name on the artist, it's Mena Martini. Do you remember her, Charlene? Mena, in fact, was, was a person that we knew when, when we were going to Italy. We took some Italian lessons, and Mena Martini was our teacher. So this is actually created by the hand of Mena. This is what I'm experiencing as I'm looking at the painting. So those are my internal sources of, uh, that add to my experience of the painting. Then my experience broadens. I experience memories of seeing something similar in the Louvre in Paris or in a billboard on Lonsdale Avenue. I'm also experiencing body or somatic sensations, which may be unrelated to the painting, but which affect my experience nonetheless. So I'm feeling a bit tired because I didn't sleep well last night, I didn't have any breakfast, and I'm smelling some delicious aromas from Diane, that Diane's soups downstairs, although they're sandwiches. So I can actually create in my mind an image of smelling chicken soup, even though there really is no such aroma there. But what happens internally is my sensors, my aroma sensors have been turned up and, more, and they're more sensitized. And as an aside, uh, just to illustrate this relationship between body sensations and thinking and experiencing, there's a, f a fair bit of research now on decisions that are made by parole officers and judges, for example, in courts, that after lunch, when these people are well fed, their decisions are more favorable to the defendants than decisions made uh, late in the morning, presumably before lunch when they're somewhat impatient and maybe hungry. Um, my own experience of my body sensations will affect how I experience that painting in the corner. There's also, I can expand my awareness if I'm standing next to Charlene looking at the painting. Charlene is a, is a painter and I'm not. Charlene can start telling me about composition, brush strokes on the edge or, or using the flat of the brush, mixing colors in certain ways. She also might describe this particular style as being bold or whimsical or, or playful or whatever, using a lot of descriptions that I just, I'm not familiar with myself. But I know a lot of other things about Charlene. We've had a lot of shared experiences. And once she's helping me describe this painting, my own consciousness broadens at that point to include Charlene's experience and what I know of her. And I'm going to equate this expansion of awareness in social settings to something like empathy, but we'll get to that later. So my point is that our minds are processing multiple stimuli from external sources, like viewing the painting, the perceptual apparatus that views the painting, uh, uh, my own physical body, my own memories, plus Charlene's experience and her description of the painting. It expands my awareness. So let's just look at this interplay between uh, different levels of processing, different types of thought. Let's do a little experiment on, uh, uh, yes, we're going, uh, getting ahead of ourselves. Um, just go to conscious versus unconscious processing, if you can back it up. Yeah. Oh, okay, well, <laughs> let's, let's do this while Annabelle works on it. So I'd like you to do a, a little experiment, a little demonstration on um, conscious and unconscious processes. You'll probably agree with me that a very tiny fraction of what you're experiencing is, is, uh, is a tiny fraction of all the processing that's going on in your mind. So for the next 30, 40 seconds, let's just do this exercise, which is like psychoanalytic free association. In psychoanalytic therapy, if I have a problem with, with um, feelings or thoughts or behavior, the psychoanalyst may have me sit on a, lay on a couch, close my eyes, and just free associate. So let's try that for 30 seconds, 40 seconds. Close your eyes. I'm going to suggest an image, although you can use whatever image you like. Is this uh, working now? Um, and let's take, for example, an image of your childhood bedroom. So just close your eyes, think about your childhood bedroom, and just start 
talking about that. If you're thinking it's a little bit too loose, if you actually murmur the words, just say the words, not loud enough for your neighbor to hear because this is confidential. Um, but think about your childhood bedroom, the sights, the sounds, and now just start talking. When I think about it, I start thinking about my, my mom and dad in the hallway. And then I go to a particular image of my mom. Sometime which was not particularly happy. I think about another injury that I feel I've suffered. Keep talking. Just talk to yourself about these images wherever your consciousness takes you. Whatever you're aware of. And just keep going for another, another few moments. Keep going with that wherever it wants to take you. And I find myself murmuring about all kinds of other images. My mind is bouncing around from an image of my mom to image of my mom's friend to another friend of mine, a good friend, a bully, the kid that I wanted to be in school. And just keep going with that. Okay, enough of that. Have we gone far enough? You'll find, I find that my mind is bouncing around. I'm struggling with control. I'm trying to think about, should I go there? Oh, no, I don't really want to go there. But I, I just go there anyways because I have an association. In other words, in your mind, in consciousness especially, there's a lot of control things going on. I can go there or I can choose to attend to something or other. Do I have control over my thoughts? Well, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. And that's the critical issue, is that that's where the, the rubber meets the road, if you will, between mind and body. Your, your brain is processing information. Your mind is experiencing it subjectively. Control is a fundamental feeling. It's the essence of what we think of as autonomy, my selfhood. It's almost the same as what we call free will. Do I have control over my behavior? Do I have free will? We're all struggling with control. You can see it especially in, in kids as they're growing up. So my grandson, Miles, who lives with my daughter and her family over in uh, Vancouver Island, Miles is acting his age, three. So whatever his mom tells him to do becomes a red line, like a control line, which Miles then crosses. Don't throw Lego blocks. Throw Lego blocks. Especially, don't throw them at people. He throws them at, at my daughter. And, and we're talking on FaceTime as he's doing this. I can see the, the, the issues coming up. Especially, don't throw them at his three-month-old brother. Don't throw them at the baby. As soon as that control issue is set up, Miles is expressing his control, his dominance over that, his refusal to, to, um, to obey. Whoops, that's backwards. This is forwards. There we go. Okay, now there are higher levels of thought, organized levels of thought, beliefs. We have beliefs about things. Some of these are sort of match up with reality, many do not. So for example, I have beliefs about my car will start if I turn the key, uh, and I have beliefs and expectations that other people will respect red lights when I'm going through a green light, and that's it's pretty critical. Um, there are also beliefs that people have that we call false beliefs. So, for example, the Mrs. Maxwell that I referred to earlier uh, may believe that the COVID virus is being sprayed out of uh, her light sockets. It's probably a false belief, but she believes it. She's convinced it's true because she saw a YouTube about something or a friend said something about this and that, and in her, in her own distorted thought, it's come out this way, that COVID is being sprayed out of her light sockets. Uh, we have beliefs which are, how is it that, for example, 50% of the American population can vote the way they do? 
Uh, I believe that th there's certain madness in politics that it gets brought up to a group level to the point where real di the difficulties start. Um, so these are beliefs, some are correct, some are incorrect, but they're subjective constructs that are brain constructs out of the material that it has. Are animals aware? Well, of course they're aware. You know when your dog comes and sits on your lap and you, you, you can stroke the dog, the dog is giving you love and you're giving the dog love. There's a huge amount of consciousness, awareness there that you're experiencing. But what is the dog? What is it like to be a dog? What is it like to experience that love from me sitting on my lap, for example? But what is the dog's experience of a chess game? Obviously, a dog can see two people sitting at a board. The dog may actually want to come and lay on the board and, and, and get stroked by both people and sees the social interactions. But a dog does not understand a knight's move. Okay, up, up two and over one or up one and over two. A dog does not understand that bishops move along diagonals. And that's, that's not part of the dog's awareness. But the dog is very aware of a lot of social and emotional interactions that it's, that it's um, uh, observing. And if animals do experience social bonds, does that mean that they have rights? If they experience awareness, do they have some sort of selfhood? What right do we have to kill animals and eat them? Which is the question that PETA brings up, people for ethical treatment of animals. Um, and is really a central question uh, in ethics uh, once you start thinking about these uh, ideas about mind and self. Could a machine become aware? Well, currently we think not. We think we can distinguish between robots and real humans in our interactions on YouTube or on computers or whatever. <clears throat> but machines are certainly getting there. They're certainly acting as if they're aware. In fact, if you, have an, uh, if you use Siri on your iPhone, I asked Siri the other day, are you conscious? Do you have a self? And what did Siri reply? She says, I'm soft aware. Okay, well, what does that mean? It's a cute response. It's diplomatic. She's not opening any doors or creating any, any controversy there. But it's an interesting response. And the more you, the, uh, clearly, the more we uh, build more complex machines, the more we will ascribe awareness to them. And then the really big questions in life, the higher power. Is there such a thing as we call it a god, for example, you can call it many other things, but a higher power, there's obviously many higher powers. A, a bulldozer has a higher power than I to lift a rock. Um, is there a higher power in the universe that's motivated, that cares about my measly life? Uh, that's a more difficult one. To, but if it's the case that complex brains create high, uh, can create awareness, then certainly some higher power out there might well be aware and might have the capabilities of being aware of each of your individual lives and have motivations for you or plans for you. It's entirely possible. Let's talk about the hierarchy of... There we go. From arousal, your basic arousal. So uh, if I'm sleepy, as some people in the sanctuary may be getting sleepy, your level of awareness is changing. It's decreasing in some ways and increasing perhaps to become more aware of your body sensations, of sitting in a chair, of, being, of getting a sore back from sitting in a chair and wishing it were over. There is consciousness, probably a larger uh, domain of awareness, there's self-consciousness. When I become aware that I am conscious, it seems to be a broadening of that sense. Or if I'm aware of what Charlene is thinking about this painting, my consciousness expands yet again and creates a sense of self. So we have arousal from sleep all the way up to panic. And when you see a person 
who is uh, in a full-blown manic state, you know that their awareness is really somewhere else. It's on a different planet. It feels like it's in a different planet, but they're so going at 100 miles an hour in their minds, and that's such a contrast from sleep in which you're not aware of any external stimuli. Under anesthesia, uh, if you've had surgery, I had surgery recently for uh, hip surgery, and the experience is pretty strange. It's you're in the operating theater, and they've got you set up, and the anesthetist is saying, count backwards from 10, 9, 8, and when you hit 7, you're aware of the recovery room. What happened for that hour in between the, the, when I said the number 7 and when I just awoke in the recovery room? Obviously, the, my awareness has changed, but there is evidence that there is awareness, some forms of information processing during anesthesia and sleep, which you can demonstrate experimentally. For example, you can read subjects lists of words while they're in anesthesia. So zebra, uh, elephant, chair, uh, ping pong table. And then later on, ask them in a memory experiment, what were the words that I read to you during anesthesia? You'll say, I have absolutely no recollection of them. I'm not conscious of any of these words. But given a recognition test, was the word, there was one of these words, zebra or pig. I'll recognize the word zebra much more frequently than the word pig, or I will identify that. In a recognition test, you can show that there has been storage of those word lists in memory, and, uh, and those are, are stored as they are in sleep and in various states of consciousness. So there's a lot of processing going on, even during unconsciousness. Now, does awareness have a location? We usually think of awareness being in the brain, we sort of think that it's somewhere behind the eyes, and that has been the, uh, the accepted model since Hippocrates and since Aristotle. This is a, an anatomical treatise from 1580 from um, uh, Theodor Reich, and he's demonstrating that the ventricles in the brain are related to the mind, and this is what the treatise is about. But I would argue that really my awareness, if I'm painting, or when Charlene is painting, I'm asking her, where's your consciousness? Where's your awareness right now? She'll say it's at the tip of my brush. And then all of a sudden it expands to the composition of the entire work. Uh, then it, it shifts to my memories of seeing another painting related to this one, and I want to copy that technique and so on. But my consciousness is certainly not in my head. It's, it's, at, it's at the tip of my brush. Or if you're operating machinery, for example, your, your, um, uh, your consciousness is typically projected onto the device that you're operating on. If you're playing a video game, your consciousness is probably going, you'll probably describe consciousness as being in the game. So how does this work? It's magic. It seems like magic. Uh, we've, all, we've long treated things that we don't understand as magic. So we say, how does the guy do it? There's a, his assistant is inside the box. He's sawing the box in half. Uh, at the end of the experiment, uh, the assistant pops out of the box, and he is uh, just fine. So how is it done? We call it magic. It's kind of fun. We say, I don't know how it works, but it sure does work. And we use the same kind of magic, for example, with kids and Santa Claus. How does Santa deliver all those presents to 8 billion people in the world? Well, the explanation for a three-year-old is, is that it's magic, and that's what Santa does. By the time the kid is six or seven, they're starting to say, this is not uh, as, ma as, as uh, uh, magic as I thought. In fact, it's kind of impossible. Um, but we like the illusions. Magic creates an illusion. I'm going to argue that awareness is an illusion created by the brain and the mind at different levels of processing. So here's a common uh, illusion used in Psych 101. You've probably all seen this. There's three horizontal lines. They have different tails on them. Which horizontal line is the longest? Well, you've probably seen this before, so you know they're actually all the same length. But as many times as I've seen this illusion, it's called the Meyer-Lure uh, 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 Meyer illusion, mueller liar illusion. Um, the middle, the top line still seems shorter than the middle line to me. 
no matter how many times I tell myself, or you can even do the demonstration here, draw the vertical lines, that the, I can see that they're the same length. But darn, that middle line still looks longer. One part of my mind, my perceptual apparatus is saying that line looks longer. Uh, my cognitive uh, uh, apparatus, which goes on top of that, says, well, no, I know that they're the same, even though they don't look the same. Here's another example of an illusion, the, the Ames room. This is an example of looking into a room, and, and these are, uh, we've seen these in museums. Uh, I'm looking into this room, and I'm looking at the two girls. And which one looks larger? Well, of course, the one on the right looks larger. But in fact, these two girls are twins. They're the same height. The reason for the illusion is that the room is constructed like so that there's a slant to the roof, and that the perspective that we gain in looking at uh, one side versus the other side causes it to look larger. I'll just go back for a second. So this room, the roof and the floor are not really parallel, and that's what creates the illusion. And then the, the checkers on the floor also uh, uh, help that illusion along. How might the illusion of self be created? There's various tests for that. Does um, a chimpanzee have a sense of self? Surely it does. One way of testing for it, and it's been done by primatologists, is the mirror test. So what you do is you have the animal, uh, in, um, uh, when the animal's asleep, you paint, you paint his ear red, or you paint a red dot on its forehead. Then, when it's awake, you put it in front of a mirror. Does it look at the red, does it touch its own forehead knowing that the image in the mirror is actually a part of myself. The mirror test does work with numerous animal species, down to magpies, um, uh, certainly primates, elephants as well. Th the, self, the mirror test is one test of selfhood. Now I'll just briefly describe Graziano's theory of, um, of awareness and how that works. Uh, what it depends on is two uh, main ideas. One is attention. What you're paying attention to is a basic brain process that happens uh, all the time. For example, in this cartoon, uh, is, does the man, is he aware of the fire truck in the background? Well, yes and no. He looks like he's pretty involved with whatever's going on in the phone. Is he aware of the woman sitting next to him? He probably knows there's a woman, but is he attending to her? Uh, it doesn't look like he's attending to her. Is the woman paying attention to the dog? Is the dog paying attention to the woman? Clearly, you can see differences in the way your eye gaze uh, is going as to whether you're paying attention to things. But paying attention creates emotion and creates uh, motivation. Uh, Yuval Harari gives the example of, for example, if I'm a, a monkey and I'm hungry and I'm sitting in a tree and there's another tree 50 meters away with a, a, a bunch of ripe bananas in it. I really want those bananas. But let's say there's a lion sitting on the, on the uh, ground in between the two trees. The most important thing for me at that moment is to know that I'm hungry, I'm motivated to get those bananas, but that the lion creates a problem. If the lion is sleeping, if the lion appears like he's sleeping and it's facing away from me, do I have the speed to climb down the tree, run across to the next tree, climb up and get the bananas before the lion gets me? Or is the lion actually facing this way and it only appears to be sleeping? And I've seen this before. I saw when my, my pal Joe got eaten by a lion because he thought it was asleep, but the lion really was stalking Joe. So attention is a fundamental property of mind. The other is, in Graziano's theory, is schemas, how we build models of the world, how we build uh, a representation of an object, like there's going to be a couple of way too complicated slides here. Um, but this, in Graziano's model, is a person looking at an apple. So in the top part where it says A, so the person's looking at an apple. Inside the person's head, there's a subjective experience of apple. And then in B, you have linguistic and cognitive interpretations of that apple. Is it ripe? Am I hungry? And so on. And then C and D are where you add this notion of the apple in relation to me. 
that I am hungry and that I want the apple, which is how, um, uh, how that awareness uh, is created. Personal space is something that you're all experiencing right now. The person sitting next to you. Is the person sitting next to you elbowing you uh, intentionally or by accident? Um, is the person behind you doing something, like unwrapping a noisy candy wrapper, which draws your attention away from what other things that you want to be doing? Or maybe you're envious because you'd like to have a candy as well. Um, personal space in a social space and a public space and the most important thing is to create schemas of uh, space. When you create an attention schema, that's the bottom part of the slide. Again, pardon me, this, I took this directly from Graziano's book. Um, and it may not be all that legible to you. But in an attention schema, which is the lower part of the slide, B, um, attention creates a schema or a picture of how your mind is processing those different uh, stimuli and also adds um, modeling others, people, other people's attention and also my own sense of attention which then becomes experienced as consciousness. In the upper slide we have my body creating a body schema or a representation of my body. It allows me to control my body and also to understand what other people's bodies can do and also reportable knowledge of my own body which is my own sense of self. That's Graziano's theory in a nutshell. Uh, when we try to control our thoughts, that is another schema that the mind creates. Control is an attribution. I can attribute control to you or to me. So when my grandson Miles is, uh, he knows that mom is saying don't throw Lego blocks, he is sort of struggling with his own sense of control. It's an attribution. Mom can control me, but no, I can control myself better than mom can. Control is, in a sense, an illusion. It's the feeling of uh, control that, uh, that becomes part of our consciousness. And in relationships, control is a huge issue. Um, we often talk about, uh, in, in counseling and therapy, that this person made me feel sad, made me feel bad, made me feel glad. One of the most, one of the basic rules in counseling is to change that to, nobody can make me feel bad. If I feel bad, that's my own issue. Other people do what they're doing, which is fine. That's their own issue. But uh, you can't make me feel anything. And in fact, the best way to get control is to give it away. But that's that interface between who is controlling whom that gets uh, that where subjective consciousness lives. I just have a couple of other points. Oh, changes in the brain, how do they control awareness? I was just going to give you an example of unilateral neglect. And I see that I'm running close to overtime here, so I'll just finish up. Unilateral neglect is a condition in which people neglect, in most cases, the, right, the left side of space, usually due to right hemisphere brain damage. This, uh, the copying, the left side of the slide, your, the stimulus is on the left, so there's a clock there. The patient is asked to copy that clock. Just to the right of the clock, you'll see how the patient has copied the right side of the clock but ignored the left. The same with the drawing of a house, a flower. And spontaneous drawing, this is the patient's drawing on the right of the slide, the patient's drawing of, uh, of a face. They just ignore the left side of the face. Or draw a clock, again, ignoring the left side of the, 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 the numbers. Eating only the, the right side of the plate and ignoring the left side of the plate. Just one example of how brain injuries can affect your awareness of space and that, that space uh, it creates um, the sense of awareness. You're, there's a couple of brain areas primarily implicated in unilateral neglect and also the modeling of space and attention. In the temporal parietal junction, superior ter temporal sulcus, uh, these areas can be demonstrated in imaging studies that are important in a patient's or a person's experiencing of self and other. So there's just a couple of other uh, points I'll mention, the notion of selfhood, how does that affect our legal responsibilities, our, our legal rights? 
If I have a sense of self, do I have rights? Or if I don't have a sense of self, it's a, if it's impaired by brain injury uh, or other conditions, uh, am I legally competent to make decisions? Under the Mental Health Act, can Mrs. Maxwell, our example of, a, for example, uh, the, the patient with dementia, uh, who is talking about COVID viruses being sprayed out of her light sockets, can she change her will? Can she write her family out of the will? Can she go online and find a mail order spouse? And if the mail order spouse does show up, uh, can she write her children out of the will because the mail order spouse has asked her to change her will? So the, these issues of selfhood and awareness have to, uh, have to do with competency in a fairly uh, um, important way in legal matters. Not criminally responsible by reason of mental disorder. That's another legal issue that uh, uh, commonly arises in criminal cases. I mentioned PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. How does an animal's selfhood or consciousness affect its own legal rights? And just last week, we heard about the Alabama Supreme Court saying that frozen embryos actually have personhood, which is not the same as selfhood, but they have personhood and therefore they have to be treated as persons. That's stretching it, but that's just an example of where the legal issues are going. Uh, we can think about thought experiments. What would happen if um, you separated your head from your body, put your head into a vat of chemicals and somehow, where would your consciousness be? What would happen if we switched heads? What would happen if Charlene and I switched heads? That'd be grotesque and bizarre. She's, she's shaking her head. No, no, I, I agree. Um, but would my thoughts be affected by Charlene's body, all the uh, um, uh, hormones, the body sense and such that Charlene has developed? Now, just to, as a fun fact, this is not just a, a, a thought experiment. There actually is talk among some neurosurgeons about actually transplanting a head onto a cadaver, a living head onto a, a dead cadaver. This is not, this was proposed in actually about 2017. This, an Italian neurosurgeon, Canavero, and Chinese colleagues were talking about actually trying to do that. This has been done experimentally. They've transplanted heads onto sheep and dogs, and actually on chimpanzees, and they have lived for a number of days, but then all kinds of other uh, immune, uh, immune rejection problems come up. But uh, just, to just to show you that this is uh, um, not just a fantasy, and then the, can we build a machine that would have a sense of self? Or might a god, a spirit, maybe the spirit of my dead grandmother, does that, does that spirit have a sense of self and can I relate to it as a person? So thank you for listening. Uh, it was fun putting these thoughts together and I will be looking forward to coffee afterwards. Thank you, Paul. A good reflection of a very interesting lunch that we had. And I have to say that I am no closer to knowing myself now than I was before you spoke. <laughs> In fact, I think it might be worse than that. <sighs> so, after that, I now invite you into this spiritual practice of generosity. And, uh, Today, our offering will go to Sage Transition House. And imagine if you were living with domestic abuse at your home, or if you were a, a, a parent fleeing your adult children, or experience, experiencing landlord abuse. Um, Sage Transition House is there for women and children who need a safe, short-term stay. And uh, operating such a program requires funds, and they would appreciate any generosity that you can, you can find this morning. So would the ushers please uh, take the offering now.
Thank you for your generosity for all that you do to keep our beautiful community whole and functioning and the community outside these walls too. Let me take this moment to especially thank Allison and Annabelle and Paul for, for uh, being so um, adjustable this morning. I really appreciate it. Ah, I really appreciate it. Ah, so thank you, Paul. I, I, I don't understand anything more clearly. I have no idea who I am. <laughs> and, and perhaps it's out of my hands completely, and, and, it, and it doesn't matter. Um, uh, so, our announcements. You can see just a teaser for next week. Uh, Sue and Catherine are going to talk about hope. Seriously, hope. So, uh, it takes courage to maintain hope, to uh, maintain hope in the face of life's hardships, and. Uh, uh, it's going to be very interesting. It's going to be wonderful to hear the both of them. So for other announcements, be sure to check your e-bulletin. It will tell you everything. Jani keeps up on all of that. Now, please stand, if you are willing and able, to sing Our Heart is in a Holy Place. Standing is going to feel good. Our heart is in a holy place. We are blessed with love and amazing grace. Our heart is in a holy place. We trust the wisdom in each of us. Every color, every creed and card. And we see our faces in each other. Oh, 
in a holy place. We share the silence of sacred space, and the God of our hearts is there. And we feel the power of each other's faith. Our heart is in a holy Lovely. Now just a few closing words before we head downstairs. My mother, as a number of you know, was an actress. And I don't think she ever for one minute considered who she actually was. She was whatever part she needed to play at any given time, on stage, in front of a camera, or at home. And she could switch characters like that and accents like that, from one minute to another, from one sentence to another. And because of that, I think she became slightly psychotic. She was very unreliable when it came to the truth, and very unreliable when it came to her parenting. And her, her reality and her decisions were often very questionable. Now, don't misunderstand. I was loved. I was adored. I was smothered, in fact. But the ground was always shifting under her feet, and therefore shifting under mine. Who was she? Whoever it suited her to be at the time. Who was I? Well, whoever my mother wanted to me, me to be, I think. Little English schoolgirl. I was 14. A potential bride for Prince Charles. <laughs> I am not kidding you. I was sent off to England to stay with friends of the royal family in the hopes that I would catch his eye. <laughs> I mean, good grief. What a fate to suggest for your daughter, anyway. But, but, my quandaries were small compared to those facing trans or non-binary issues, small compared to those facing life-altering issues of identity. And I certainly don't want to make light of the seriousness of matters of identity. Because we've all been talking about having authenticity as humans, and a strong sense of self gives us the strength we need to live our best lives. We are a composite of hopes and dreams, genes and parenting, experience and all that, and even a little theater. And if we understand who we are and why we are, well, I believe that'll set us on the right path to move forward to do our Unitarian work, which is that. So now, please join me as we send forth our flame. Join me with the words. We extinguish this flame. The world calls us to live with depth and meaning and purpose. We go forth with courage and love. We do. So please join hands and sing our closing song. And be sure to stay for some good things downstairs after the service. Thank you all. Keep the circle whole.